following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading and I will be your host today. I'm joined by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today, we'll talk about the great rebalancing of liquidity and market risks. Ben, we're gonna get started with you. Tips have been supercharged, primarily by the Fed's increasing ownership. They're up to 24%. We've got a chart that we'll show next, and can you tell us what's happening? Sure, both Jim and I have been harping on this a lot lately, is that you know, the liquidity component that's behind a lot of markets, this kind of bigger picture before we dive into this, has been a big, again, the Fed and, and fiscal stimulus has had a big impact on dampening volatility expectations and really these liquidity premiums across nearly every and all markets. So one place you can see that very clearly is in the tips space. So the Fed has gone on to purchase, they were purchasing about 10%, they had about 10% of uh, tips outstanding before the crisis hit uh, in February, March, but now they own as much as 24% of tips outstanding, which is you know, a sizable, sizable amount. Tips uh, are in general uh, less liquid than treasuries. So they do have this liquidity premium that gets built into them. There's many different ways to try to suck that out. DKW models, the one that the Fed prefers, what we like to do, and we have a chart showing this, uh, is essentially sucking out liquidity premium as well as the Fed purchases of tips from uh, tips and then looking at tips break evens to see how much that's actually impacting or giving rise to tips break evens. And what we found, we talked about this in past podcasts, is that we're adding as much as 30 basis points to tips break evens just by pulling down that tips yield thanks to uh, a lack of liquidity <laughs> premium built into it with the Fed purchases. Uh, and the same thing is happening at the short end of the curve, as much as 70 basis points has been added to your tips break evens. So really tips break evens, if you remove those liquidity um, measures and the Fed purchases, you end up with break even somewhere around you know, 190 to 200 basis points, which is not as enthusiastic as markets would uh, make you think or as the media would make you think. Doesn't mean inflation's not coming, it just means that the markets are, may not be pricing in yet as much inflation as you think they are. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that, you know, the bigger picture here is that these liquidity premiums may matter and they matter a lot. And a lot of us look at these markets for signaling. And when you get these big liquidity premiums in them, the signaling can be a little bit skewed. So yeah, it's big what's happening. In fact, the Bank of International Settlements put out a report very similar. I think, Ben, you might've ghost wrote it. Uh, that said that liquidity premiums are a big influence on the tips market. So when you look at the tips break evens, I tend to say stand back five feet from the chart. Okay, it's going up. So it tells you that more inflation is being priced in and then end right there. Let's not try and get a little bit too fancy about, it. well, it's 220 versus 190 uh, because of these liquidity premiums. I'll quote um, my favorite quote of the month, Charles Goodhart. Uh, British economist at the Goodhart Law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases being a measure. And we all look, look, I watched Bloomberg TV today and I heard it no less than half a dozen economists say, well, tips break evens are telling us X, Y, or Z about inflation. Well, are they? Or are they telling us X, Y, or Z about the Fed's footprint in that market and not necessarily about the market's outlook for inflation? So yeah, there's a liquidity premium in there. It's important. If you're a trader in this puff, and it's important to understand it and trade it, but if you're an economist looking for market signaling, be very careful because liquidity premium does not translate into future inflation. It's another aspect altogether that doesn't have any input with future inflation. 
Yeah, and one real quick comment on that too, for those that are looking at inflation, as Jim knows, and we talk about, we like looking at inflation swaps and the caps and floors, the options on them. And with five-year tips break evens now pushing 250 basis points, and you know we really think that they're closer to 200 basis points when you suck out all of the, uh, suck out that dampened liquidity premium. But this means that, you know, fine, 250 basis points, uh, we're kind of on the cusp of something bigger potentially than the caps and floors market is indicating there's really still about a 40% probability of uh, investors believing two and a half percent headline inflation can happen over the next two to 30 years. But now if we can pump up, push above 250 basis points and, and the five-year TIS break evens and get the inflation swap caps and floors to say, yes, better than 50% probability, that two and a half percent headline inflation is coming. Now we got this inflation story really kicking into high gear. Um, so I, I think a lot of people are, like Jim just said, are rushing too fast with tips break evens to this inflation story. Not that it's not going to happen and matter, but the trigger point has, hasn't really happened yet. Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to keep in mind about the inflation story is I happen to think it will return later this year, but it's not evident right now. We'll have to wait and see whether later this year actually pans out, as, as I like to think it will, in terms of inflation. So if you're looking for evidence now of inflation, you're not going to see it now. Let's check back, see, towards the end of the summer, and then we could talk, start talking about whether or not the evidence has arrived at that point. Our next question today is, monetary and fiscal policy tearing down liquidity premiums in credit markets just like sovereign bonds. Ben, do you want to start with this? Yes, I mean, I think that's a unanimous yes. We have triple C to triple B OAS. It's collapsed to the spread between those OAS down to about 429 basis points. Since the financial crisis, 400 basis points has been kind of the floor for that spread. And I think a lot of that destruction in terms of, uh, not destruction, I guess it's a good thing, but the, the tearing down in those risk profiles is thanks to Fed buying. Now, a lot of that's kind of gone away with the ETF purchases they were making of LQD and HYG and so on, but it still lingers. I think Jim always says this uh, better than I do, that it, this backstop is there in the mind of investors. They could rush back and help support this market. And a great way to look at just how low these risks are in markets right now is B of A has these indices called their global liquidity risk index and their global solvency risk index. And that's a chart that we have up right now. And anything that's low means that things are easy, uh, better. Anything that's high means it's their stress. And right now using CDS, sovereign spreads, currencies, the volatilities and the risk embedded in them, the, uh, the solvency risk and liquidity risk remain just uh, ab you know, absolutely low. Now, it doesn't mean liquidity issues can't arise. We saw that last week in the treasury market, and that shows how potentially fragile things are, and that's a whole nother um, discussion. But I think there's no doubt we've torn down that volatility. The big question going forward now is with the markets beginning to price in rate hikes, maybe 2024, maybe starting to come into 2023, and the potential for raising, rising interest rates, you know, with the vol going higher now at the long end of the curve, does that going to move to the you know shorter and shorter in the curve? And does that mean that credit volatility is very much an odd man out? So what we have another chart we're looking at is the implied volatility on a one or three month basis for the HYG uh, ETF, which is high yield corporate bonds relative to the 30 year bond using TLT. So if you take TLT divided by HYG's implied volatility, we get this uh, kind of big ratio that was up around three to one there for a period of time. Historically, that's been unsustainable and historically that has led to higher credit volatility. So the big thing that we need to be worried about is interest rate risk. I don't care if it's inflation or if it's just rising term premium and you know demand for a greater compensation for that risk taken for the curve, that's gonna have to correct itself. Meaning credit volatility has to rise here at some point and can't remain essentially that odd man out. How and when that happens, I don't know. Bankruptcy risks have certainly uh, fallen, which is good. Um, and But we're not necessarily out. That's a, that's a story of the pandemic. Now this is a story of rip-roaring growth and what that does to interest rates and how that percolates and gets um, kind of accepted and understood and, and accounted for within high yield and investment grade markets. Yeah, a couple of things real quick. One, as Ben mentioned, 
Back in December, when Steve Mnuchin announced that they were going to end a lot of the emergency programs of the corporate bond buying program, the ETF program, which ended December 31st, the Fed's first reaction was pushback. They didn't want to end them. They wanted to keep going. And then people fretted that the markets were going to fall apart. And the argument was, see, the Fed wants these programs. They're going to end. That's fine. They'll come back the minute they're needed. So don't worry that they're not there now. They're just around the corner when needed. The Fed will step in and they've got your back. Speaking of got your back, why that's important is in the high yield market, it trades roughly a according to Trace, the, uh, the the reporting requirements, about $9 billion a day of um, power amount trades in the high yield market. Uh, right now, about 25 or 30 billion trades in the investment grade market, just to give you um, a benchmark there. HYG, um, JNK, and all of the other ETFs combined have a trade, have a value that they trade every day, which is about half the size of the high yield cash market. So 50% the size of the high yield cash market. In investment grade, it's about 10%. So a lot of what's happened with the high yield market is that it has become a high yield market and not a market of high yield bonds. We seem to, we, we rush in and out of these ETFs and they all go up and down together because the dealers price them off of a matrix. If a bunch of, if a bunch of money comes into HYG, we mark all the bonds up. If a bunch of money flows out of HYG, we mark a lot of the bonds down as well too that combined with the fed's got your back i think is holding down this inflation so when ben talks about something's going to get this inflation or volatility i'm sorry volatility down when ben talks about volatility has to go up in the high yield market maybe it's bankruptcy maybe it's something else how about just systemic etf uh, outflows or systemic etf issues that can drive this volatility especially at the high yield end because it's such a big component no other etf dominates its underlying cash market like HYG, JNK, and the rest of the high yields to the high yield market. As I said, it's about 10% in investment grade. If you go to gold or you go to biotech stocks or anything else, it gets down in the low single digits, This the value that they trade in the ETF versus the underlying cash market. So high yield is very unique and its relationship with ETFs is very, very important. Let's move next to our final topic of the day. When and how will near-term treasuries volatility expectations catch up with other assets, including commodities and equities? So here is what's been really interesting is that we, within applied volatilities, and I've called this the great rebalancing of risks, uh, it, we initially saw commodity volatility just go a lot appreciably higher, specifically in industrial metals. It could be copper, tin, zinc, nickel, and so on. That's been followed by grains. And then we saw equities remain uh, pretty uh, elevated still. For the most part, the VIX still remains pretty high. But um, the question now is, do we need this kind of rebalancing to happen? And this chart shows it really well. This is uh, all of the implied volatilities, three month implied volatilities relative to swaps and vol. Essentially, what is the implied volatility for the treasury market for the two year over the, uh, sorry, for the five year over the next two years? And so the more short end belly volatility remains abnormally low. So again, let me back up the ratio here is that swaps and vol, treasury vol, divided by the amount of vol that's seen in each asset class. And what you can see is that when the Fed came in in March, POW, they tore down that short end volatility in the treasury market. They're not gonna do anything. Yields didn't move at the short end of the curve for a very long time. And that was this outlier that we've seen in these ratios. And I show them here as Z-scores. You saw, saw these two standard deviation events, negative side. And now we're for the first time, uh, really throughout this pandemic and the accident potentially, we're seeing vol start to rebalance itself. So that's the short end volatility is beginning to play catch up with all of these other asset classes as well as the long end of the curve. As this happens, this means interest rate risk, inflation risk is getting embedded in markets and also means these liquidity premiums are likely gonna become a bigger issue. Now the Fed is now saying maybe going to um, move into operation twist or maybe they'll wanna control the long end of the curve that will help dampen liquidity premiums. It always has in the past, we'll see if that's the case. But if not, if the markets, investors keep 
kind of inching in uh, the rate hikes or potential for tightening like Jim's always been talking about. The closer and closer that gets, the more and more this chart needs to go to zero, all these lines, and we need to see short end volatility essentially match in terms of the treasury curve, match all of these other asset classes. And to me, that's the great rebalancing, and that will potentially wreak some kind of havoc on the markets. That means interest rate risk starts to brew pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Now, the Fed um, is mostly been in control of this, but the markets are beginning to test that with their pulling in again of rate hikes, the degree of tightening. And I think I have a chart here I can show real fast, then I'll pass it over to Jim, that shows real yields and how much they are controlled by essentially Fed rhetoric. So real yields, looking back to the late 1990s, have a strong connection. We can explain almost 70% of the variation in that 10-year tip yield using essentially FOMC sentiment from their communications, their degree of uncertainty or ambiguity, and their, then their degree of, a, uh, of agreement. So once we see them become less agreement, which is uh, less, uh, I guess, agreeing with each other, which we've started to see, and we see uncertainty rise or sentiment get better, then that means real yields need to rise. That means the rate hikes are getting pulled closer and this interest rate risk and potentially liquidity issues too become a bigger, bigger problem for, uh, for financial markets and investors at large. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. And I'll summarize it this way. As I, as I look at the, the Fed policy chart that goes back to the late 1990s or mid 1990s, from that moment till now, the driving force behind interest rates was real growth. If you got it, rates went up. If you didn't get it, rates went down. In a real growth world, that's good. That's more earnings. That's a higher standard of living. Everybody's happy with it. If the Fed wants to come in and squash interest rates, go for it, man. It's fine if it's a real growth world. If it morphs to an inflation world, then that, I think, changes things. Because we haven't seen that since Greenspan was in charge back in the 90s, and we've never tried any of these tools in a period of rising inflation because we haven't had it in 25 years or so. In that case, I've argued, and I think that's what your vol charts are showing, that if the market is getting worried about inflation returning, then Fed rhetoric, oh, it's all fine, we could come in with Operation Twist, we could sit on it, there's no inflation, it's a base effect, Ooh, that gets them nervous because they're worried about this, and you're dismissing it. And then you're telling them that in the face of rising inflation, you'll force more negative real rates on them. And that's not a good thing. This is, I think, the, the crux to the push pull in the bond market and the stock market right now. Why are rates rising? Is it real growth? That's fine. If, if they want to go up with real growth stocks, you can go back to new highs. Is it fear of inflation? If that's the case, that could be problematic. And if you throw in Jay Powell speaks Thursday, where he waves his hand and just says, there is no inflation. We can print money and keep rates down. Don't worry about it. That could really bother the market a lot more. And we've started to see that in other markets as well, too, especially the yield curve control markets in Australia and Japan. They have yield curve control and their rates are starting to move up. And in case of Australia, they've gotten very aggressive in trying to bring those rates back down. Europe doesn't have yield curve control, but they've promised that they're ready to start acting if rates go up. And Japan has been very mum, even though they're well above their yield curve control target as well too. So really, again, it comes down to why are rates rising? Is it inflation fears or is it growth fears? And that is the issue. Last thought on that is, of course, everybody says it's growth fears because as we talked about in the last section, inflation is not evident now. So it's gotta be growth. But the market's supposed to be forward looking. It's supposed to be anticipating what's coming next. That could very well be growth. There could be very well be a giant head faking inflation here. But if there isn't, then I think we're going to be in a whole different ball game here. The more the Fed talks dovishly, the, the worse the bond market will be. We're going to go back to the old bond market vigilantes of uh, Ed Yardeni days in the 1980s. We haven't seen that in a long time. <laughs> Let me just wrap up real quick. What I'll say is on top of what Jim just said is that if you want to get a flavor for when this risk, be it inflation, growth, but likely inflation, I mean, really watch the short end volatilities, implied volatilities, looking out a year to two years, you know, basically into 2022, 2023. That volatility profile has not yet exceeded pre pandemic levels, while 2024 and beyond have. So that's where most of the excitement is out there right now. And that's what's uh, impacting 
you know, term premiums and uh, bonds in general. But if those implied vols, swaps and vols, push above pre-pandemic levels for the 2023-2022 outlook, then you have this scenario and this issue that Jim's talking about. Markets now, investors are pushing back on the Fed and they're saying, no, you know, something's coming sooner, tightening, um, even, even just general tightening the financial conditions than the Fed would like. Um, and so I would watch those as closely as you can. Jim, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I just agree with Ben, especially in the 2022-2023 <laughs> volatility, because you could also throw in there too, is that's kind of where people think that the next tightening is going to come, right? 23, 24. And if you start seeing volatility ratchet up in that area, they're starting to rethink the, where the vol where the next tightening is going to come. In other words, they're pulling it forward. So if we start to see that start to rise, keep that in mind as well, too. Well, thank you both for joining us today and for your thoughts. And thank you to our audience as well. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is our institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent research offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.